I'm your host, Aaron Heath. I'll take a moment and thank you for downloading, subscribing, and most importantly, listening to episode number 57 of the Gun Rights in Texas podcast. You can find the show notes by going to gunrightsintexas.com slash 057. Now for this episode, I'm going to skip the gun of the show. We'll put this episode's gun off until a later episode. However, I want to touch on something that has been keeping me really busy, and that's life. You see, I've been extremely busy with work, doing maintenance on the Jeep, and a number of other things, but I had to have some downtime this week, and I had to decompress. Well, I did that. My buddy Ray, he wanted to go catch the Avengers movie, and we went ahead and made a run to Lubbock and did that. I'm not going to go into details about the movie. I'm not going to spoil it, but let me say that in this movie, the good guys were the only ones that had guns. It was the police and the you know, city or the military, the villains really didn't have guns. They had high tech. Mm, If you're a Star Trek fan, we could call them phaser rifles, but they didn't actually have guns that shot bullets. Very unrealistic. Well, some of the bad guys did in the opening of the movie, but that wasn't the bad guys the movie was about. So they really don't count, do they? But anyways, the point of it is the movie kind of pushed a gun control utopia type position and at the same time it really didn't say anything about gun control it was just oh yeah uh in our movie only the bad guys at the very start are going to have guns and the good guys throughout the movie will have guns i don't like it other than that well i'll let you make your decision on the movie i thought it was a good movie though now that we've got that out of the way let me go ahead and run the audio clip that tells you how to get the show then we'll come right back and jump into listener feedback the Gun Rights in Texas podcast is available on iTunes, on Stitcher, on Myro Player, YouTube, the website, and of course, in your favorite app using the RSS feed on the website. With all those options, there is no excuse for not subscribing. Links to all these can be found on every page of the website. Well, Desiree wrote in to tell me that she really appreciated the extra content regarding episode 55 in the blog side of the Gun Rights in Texas website. That content is the audio clip I played of Representative Phillips telling the telling Representative Stickland why unlicensed open carry is dead. Now, she also sent in a link to a story about Stickland violating house rules or possibly violating house rules on a different issue. And I'll throw a link to that into the... I'll sh- uh, let me get that straight. I'll throw that link into the show notes along with what I just said about her uh, email. Now, she said I could talk about it. She just didn't say I could include the full email. So I kind of paraphrased everything she said. But let's talk about this. Representative Stickland, he he leaves a lot to be desired. I mean, he's dedicated to his cause. Don't get me wrong. Dedication is good. Dedication without strategy is foolhardy at best. You see, he made it. He went in. He made an ass of himself. And he's pretty much ensured that any legislation he introduces isn't going to go very far. And that's not something you want to do. Now, if you have, if you, if you had a legislature more like what was going on in 1871, this might have went over a little better. It might not have. Who knows? But with the current legislature, it doesn't fly very well. And then you throw in the fact that he was disregarding or possibly disregarding rules and including witnesses that wanted to testify for a bill by not, but weren't there. Well, that kind of seals his fate as far as his credibility goes. And the truth of the matter is when you have a legislature and they don't like a particular member, a legislator, that legislator cannot get anything passed. His vote becomes useless. His advocacy becomes toxic. Let's say he gets reelected. Let's say that Open Carry Texas brings the constitutional carry bill that they filed with him or the one that they filed with the Senate back and they give it to him, say, okay, run with this. At that point, the bill's guaranteed to be dead. Not because the bill's bad, but because the bill's being carried by someone who can't get it done. I mean, there's a lot of jokes you you could make about somebody or their uh, potency, but we're not going to do that. You see, the problem is, by destroying his credibility, he has destroyed the credibility of anyone he associates with. He is now toxic among the legislature. 
And unfortunately for him, I really can't think of a way to fix it. I'm a problem solver by nature, and I don't know how he would fix it. Anyways, I want to go ahead. I want to hit the audio clip that tells you how to find the show on social media, and then I'll come back and we'll hit our topic. Or actually, it's a number of topics, but we'll, we'll hit them after this. The Gun Rights in Texas podcast has a social media presence. You can like it on Facebook. You can follow it on Twitter. You can circle it on Google+, and you can follow it on Instagram. With all those options, let's get social. Now, our topic for this episode is, well, we're going to cover a number of different topics. We're going to cover the arguments against gun rights that we're seeing on attacks against the CHL reciprocity. And then we're going to move on and we're going to very briefly cover a legislative update. Well, no, we're going to combine the OCT bad behavior into the legislative update. And then we'll wrap the show up with the contact info in the news and then sign out of here. This is going to really, this is really going to take a number of, uh, well, let me put it this way. This episode's going to be short. That's the only way to describe it. Well, the attacks on reciprocity. This is kind of funny. You see, uh, the gun banners are literally losing their minds over this. They don't want somebody open carrying under an out-of-state license. Well, let's be honest. They don't want anybody carrying under any kind of license. They don't want anybody carrying at all. In fact, they don't even want guns to be legal for anybody but them and the military and law enforcement that they control. In other words, if they don't control that gun, they don't want it being out there. What does this mean about, or what does this mean for reciprocity? Well, they keep attacking reciprocity and they keep saying, making statements like, well, We don't recognize out-of-state medical license. We don't recognize out-of-state engineering license or out-of-state electrician's licenses or out-of-state plumber's licenses. And the thing about it is, when you look at a medical professional, whether they're a doctor, a nurse, or an x-ray technician, and you're looking at engineers, electricians, plumbers, all these people are professionals that have to have a license to do their business. And... They're wanting to limit Texas carry of firearms to a Texas license. I got news for them. Professionals who carry a firearm are, for the most part, already limited to having a Texas license. When you compare apples to apples, law enforcement is really what you're going to have to compare to a doctor. And in order to be a recognized law enforcement officer and carry a handgun in the state of Texas under or to carry it professionally, you have to have a Texas uh, law enforcement license. And that means you have to be T-Close certified. You have to be with a department in Texas. So you can't, a peace officer or someone that has a peace officer's license and that T-Close certification in Texas that's unemployed cannot carry a firearm. Now, they may be able to carry it if they're a licensed bodyguard and then they're self-employed. That might work. But then again, they still have to have that T-close professional certification and license. Now, the closest thing we can compare a concealed handgun license with is a driver's license. We recognize out-of-state licenses in Texas for drivers. And, you know, that's a good thing, right? I mean, it'd be kind of absurd if somebody from New Mexico, which is less than 30 miles from where I'm doing this podcast right now, decided to come over here to Texas, do some shopping, they get pulled over, and they get arrested for driving without a license. That'd be kind of absurd, even though they had an out-of-state license. And in reality, if we're licensing the carrying of handguns, we really have to look at it the same way. In all honesty, when they start making these arguments that we do not, that we license doctors, we need to throw it back at them. Well, we already licensed the professional carrying of arms. However, if we really want to change the CHL, let's move it where we recognize all state licenses to carry. It doesn't matter if it's uh, California, which we recognize, or a Nevada, or which I believe we recognize. In fact, I think Texas recognizes almost all states' concealed handgun licenses. Let's recognize all of them. That's my position. Let's recognize them all. Let's take reciprocity agreements out of the equation. Let's just simply say... If you have a concealed handgun license or equivalent from another state, Texas will recognize it. And there are those who say, well, 
you don't really like C.J. Grisham, and he says he's carrying on an out-of-state license. doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if I like somebody, if I dislike somebody. It doesn't change my position on the fact that I think we should recognize every state's concealed handgun license. And that's really my position on that. Let's take a look at the legislature and what all's been going on there. And really, I have two issues. I want to condense all of it down. There are a lot of issues, actually. I'm going to condense it down to this. A number of bills have made progress in their house of origin. However, this is issue number two that I wish to address on the legislature. The standoff between the houses is still ongoing, meaning that they are both kind of, sort of, not, but not really doing this well. We don't want your bill to pass because we want our bill to pass. And this is stupid. This is really stupid. You got less than a month before the legislature ends, and we're over here... We're over here having a contest to see who's going to blink first. I, I'll be honest. I didn't vote for this. I don't think anybody voted for this. To be honest, I really like an inefficient government. You really don't see anything bad happening from it. The downside is you don't see anything good coming out of it either. But one thing that may change it, change where the situation stands in some regards, is the fact that Open Carry Texas has been busy. And you know what? It's actually been busy distance, distance, blah, let me get my tongue untied, distancing itself from the actions of some of its members. I want to read you a quote that CJ posted to, I want to say this is CJ. It may be just Open Carry Texas posted this. And a lot of this is coming from listeners, but I think this was actually posted to their main Facebook page, the group, not the group, but the uh, actual uh, page. And I want to read this as it's uh, written. Once again, the media and rabble-rousers are spreading false information without even attempting to get facts. Open Carry Texas had absolutely no part in this weekend's protest in Dallas related to the Baltimore death and subsequent riots. We take no position on the purposes and intent of the protest one way or another because they do not meet our mission statement. While we cannot stop our members from attending these protests on their own, nor would we try to, They do not do so as representatives of Open Carry Texas. Or actually he put OC or they put OCT. Now this isn't a bad thing to actually post. However, this does kind of say, well, we can't control our members, and that's not something you want out there at this time if you're trying to get change in the legislature. And then in their closed Facebook page, at least one of them, I've had people sending me uh, I've actually got a screenshot somewhere of this, but I've had people send me uh, stuff about them begging for money to file a lawsuit against the DPS. Now, one listener cut and pasted it to the uh, to the emails, so I'm going to read to you what was cut and pasted, or copy and pasted. If a group of us sued DPS, or sued DPS, would you be willing to help? We have an attorney that will work on contingency, but we need $4,000 up front for paralegal and filing fees. To be transparent, this is a civil case. While there is no guarantee we'll get anything by way of financial compensation, the possibility exists. As for my part, any money above and beyond my legal cost, bail, etc., that I may receive if we win will be donated to Open Carry Texas. I can't speak for the others. In other words, if we set up a crowdfunding for this to once and for all hold DPS accountable for violating our rights, would you support it? As far as I know, none of those arrested at the Capitol are independently wealthy. Now, my understanding is that C.J. Grisham posted that, I, and I think I get that impression from the screenshot. The thing I have is you don't start something like this when you're pushing for legislation. Why are you doing this, Grisham? If you're going to be pushing for this, wait until after the legislature adjourns, sign die. Okay? That's what I would suggest. But then again, you don't listen to me. And OCT is once again refusing to learn from past mistakes, or maybe they're just trying to stir up controversy to kill any pro-gun legislation that still has a chance. You see, they're having a rally to educate our Acevedo and the Austin PD. Now, what are they going to educate them about? Well, it's going to be held in Austin in front of the police department on May 6th of 2015. And this is what they've posted to Facebook about it. Austin Police Chief Art Acevedo is at war with gun owners. He has testified several times against bills that return more gun rights to Texas or to Texans. 
He has called gun rights activists extremists, called them hate groups, and compared them to the KKK and Black Panthers racist groups. He has been quoted as saying laws designed to force law enforcement to respect constitutional rights of citizens is akin to the death of common sense. He has openly encouraged citizens to report their neighbors who own modern sporting rifles. Enough is enough. For two years, gun owners have proven there is nothing scary about open carry. It's time Chief Acevedo wised up and started respecting and protecting our rights, not his rhetoric. We're not asking, we're demanding it. Okay, Or in other words, we're going to stomp our feet and hold our breath until he changes his way. The problem with that is you either pass out or you give up. You see, he's not going to, he's not going to change his ways. He's died in the wool. He's, he said as an anti-gunner, he's going to continue to act this way. And there's nothing you can do about it. Why are you going to waste energy and time and effort to do this rally? All the legislatures in session in the same city that the legislatures in session in while you're trying to get bills passed. All you're doing is giving the other side ammunition. You're giving them something to take to the people that are that may go one way or the other, or maybe people that are that are currently going your way that with the right nudge might go the other way. You're giving the anti gunner something to go to those people and say, Look, this is why you need to support our position. And they may just do it. We're, we've got less than a month to get legislation passed. We don't have time to go back and fix something. And yet, OCT is trying to do this? No, this isn't helping. Unless maybe you're trying to help the other side. Once again, this is something you don't do while the legislature is in session. And you definitely don't do it in, their home, in the legislature's hometown. You do this after it's adjourned, sign, die. Okay? Or you don't do it at all. But no, OCT wants to do it while the legislature is in session in order to help the anti-gunners sway the people that can be swayed. That's all there is to it. They may not intentionally be doing it for that reason, but that's really what they're doing. And then they go and they prove they can take the wrong approach and have no real knowledge of the issues in front of them. And the reason I say this is because the Brazoria County admin for OCT posted a police encounter on YouTube. Actually, I think he posted it somewhere and then one of the other OCT admins went in and changed it up and then put in where they're begging for money in the video playback. And they can't even do that right. Where they suggested donations of 233 and 763, those probably should have been suggestions of 223 and 7.62. You know, they like to take uh, rifle calibers and handgun calibers and make donation amounts out of them. But anyways, though, this Brazoria County admin, he keeps asking the police if he's being detained, which is okay. Don't get me wrong. That's okay. Up until they tell him, yes, he's being detained. At that point, you don't need to keep asking the question because you got your answer. You're being detained. They said it. Good man. Move on. But no, he keeps asking it, even after they tell him yes. Up until that point, yeah, keep asking if you're being detained. When they tell you you can't go, then uh, you've actually caught him in a lie. If you can't go, you're detained. So if they tell you you're not detained, but no, you can't leave, well, you're lying. But that's beside the point because, see, the whole the whole point of this is the stop was done in order to check and see if the weapon was unloaded because these officers thought the weapon had to be unloaded. And then the officer tells them to prove the carry of loaded weapons is legal. You can't prove something that's not prohibited. And he, he tells the officer that confronted him, or he tells the officers that they confronted him rather than tell them there's no prohibition in the law. What's legal or what's not illegal is therefore legal. He doesn't go into that. He doesn't go into the got it. The burden of proof is on the state. He doesn't go into those things. What does he do? Well, you confronted me. And then he demands the officers show him the prohibition while he continues, while he continues to fail in his, in the goal of trying to explain to him there is no prohibition. Tell him, look, there's no prohibition. Feel free to look for it, but it's not there. If it was, it would be in Texas Penal Code Section 46. But no, he doesn't do that. In the end, these officers come to the conclusion on their own. But this is a long video, and he fails to take steps that he could use to shorten the encounter. In fact, it almost seems like he's intentionally lengthening the, the encounter 
I mean, you can be a lot less verbally combative without giving up your rights. You can offer to show them where the, you know, where it would be if it was in there. You can direct them to where you don't have to provide ID unless you're arrested. You can do all that. That would shorten the encounter. Or at least it would show that you're trying to be, you're trying to assist them rather than impede them. And he also, when he posted the video, it shows that he fails to understand that while the legislature is in session, we don't need these kinds of things becoming an issue. In all honesty, this last week, OCT has gone out of their way to show their ass. That's really all it is. It's kind of like, hey, we're going to misbehave. We're going to stomp our feet and we're going to demand unlicensed carry because, well, we want it. You're not going to give it to us. We're going to act like children. That's really what they're doing. And that's stupidity. There's no reason to act this way. There is no reason to do any of this. And yet they do. But you know what? I want to run the audio clip that tells you how to contact me. And I'll come back. I want to hit the news and I want to wrap this show up because I've taken longer on my rants against OCT than I wanted. I don't want to give them any more airtime than necessary. And let me say, Open Carry Texas has a lot of potential. They have name recognition. If they, if they really worked on the PR side of things, they could do a lot of good. Unfortunately, they figured out that they can get all the attention they want by giving us bad publicity as gun owners. Every time somebody in the press wants an example of a gun owner that's going to act the way that fills out whatever stereotype they're trying to push at that moment, all they got to do is look through the different open carry groups, including Open Carry Texas, Open Carry Tarrant County, uh, Come and Take It, Texas Carry, and Texas Carry to a lesser extent because Texas Carry has actually been behaving themselves during the legislative session for the most part, or Texas Gun Rights. And you know what? After we come back from this, from the contact info, and before I start the news, I'll touch on that. If you want to contact the podcast, please send email to Aaron at gunrightsintexas.com. Or you can leave a comment on the webpage, which is gunrightsintexas.com. However, if you want to leave a voicemail and be featured on the show, then please do so by dialing 409-292-6736. I've been contacted by people in a number of instances about they want to be taken off of a mailing list. They don't want to get emails. They don't want to get snail mail. I don't know which one it is or if it's both. But these people are contacting me because apparently they're getting information and the closest and the first thing they can find when they start looking for gun rights in Texas is the podcast website. So they assume it's me that's sending this stuff out. And it's not. You see, what what they're getting is from TX Gun Rights or Texas Gun Rights. And I've I've returned emails, I've returned phone calls. And the truth of the matter is this. Texas Gun Rights has no affiliation with Gun Rights in Texas. Gun Rights in Texas has no affiliation of any kind, official or otherwise, with any of these organizations that are out there. I may direct you to an organization, I may suggest an organization, but we're not affiliated with them, officially or otherwise. I consider Charles Cotton to be a friend. He's a member of the NRA Board of Directors. He's a pro bono legislative counsel for the TSRA. He's the head of the Texas Firearms Coalition, but that's the extent of it. I consider him a friend. He has no control over the show other than he speaks, I listen, and I consider what he says. But if I don't agree with that position or I don't think I need to go the route that he's suggesting people go, I don't. When it comes to legislation, I'm all for saying, yeah, listen to Charles Cotton because he's got a lot more experience than I do. Or listen to Alice Tripp because she has a lot more experience than I do. And they're the ones in the trenches. They're the ones at the legislature saying, these are our bills. This is what we want. They're the ones that know how to get legislation passed. And I have no problem directing people to them. And this Texas gun rights, I had no knowledge about them. I did a little research. Their domain was registered in 2013. And it looks like they're a state subdivision of, wait for it, the National Association for Gun Rights, or NAGR. Now, for those of you who don't know, NAGR is Dudley Brown's little organization. And, you know, Dudley Brown's not exactly somebody that's really popular for a good reason. He's got a lot of name recognition. 
and you can go to the Second Amendment Foundation. You can go to Students for Concealed Carry on Campus. You can go to a lot of gun rights organizations and find where they're saying, hey, this guy, he's a liar. I mean, I'll straight up say it. These organizations show where the National Association for Gun Rights, Dudley Brown, have actually gone out and tried to claim credit for others' work that he had nothing to do with or he even tried to kill. Kind of like somebody or a, a, a group here in Texas. But this isn't the end of it. You see, I will try to help anybody that's on these mailing lists get off. I don't see it happening, but I will call Texas Gun Rights out on it. And if Texas Gun Rights is you know, sending emails out to people, make sure you include that uns- unsubscribe link because that's kind of a requirement also. Go to the trouble of having a go to the trouble of providing information for somebody to unsubscribe from your snail mail list if you have one. That's all. But in the news, in the pol- politics category, good lord, my tongue is still tied. We're going to go with an old standby, Moms Demand Action and Kroger. You see, they don't seem to have learned from their previous failures in this effort, so they're going to try another boycott, which I don't think the old boycott had ever been called off. So I guess this is a double boycott now. Instead of buying something, you're not going to buy something from them twice. That don't make no sense. Mom's Demand Action doesn't make no sense. Coincidence? I think not. But moving on, students for concealed carry on campus held a counter-protest at the University of Texas where a rally to protest campus carry legislation was being held in a location on campus. Now the irony of this whole thing is that where they chose to hold the rally in opposition to campus carry legislation is a location where concealed carry is already legal. So when students for concealed carry on campus attended the counter rally for the rally against the legislation, they could have been carrying. Who knows? Why? Because if they did, they were doing it concealed. However, and this is what's sad, in an effort to prevent radical open carry activists from crashing the protest or the counter protest with long guns, students with concealed carry or students for concealed carry on campus actually went public with their press release only three hours before the event. That's sad. It's sad when you have to delay a press release to keep to keep the people that would that claim to be on your side from trying to involve themselves. And I agree with the logic that, well, you don't want open carry Tarrant County. You don't want open carry Texas. You don't want to come and take it at this rally openly carrying long guns, even though they can legally do so. It would actually give more ammunition to the anti-gunners. But there'll be a link to the Concealed Campus press release, or it may be an article that's on their website. But the students for Concealed Carry on Campus, uh, they have this on their website, and I'll throw a link up for that in the show notes. In our final story, well, this one hits kind of close to home. You see, I live and work not far from Andrews County, which has the county seat of Andrews, Texas, which is kind of where this podcast got started. But I was actually surprised when I saw this one come across my feed because I had not heard about it. The thing is, Benny Boyd, that's a, that's a Chrysler Dodge Jeep dealership in Andrews, Texas, is offering a free, and there's quotation marks around that free, AR-15, Ruger Bolt Action Rifle, or Smith & Wesson 9mm handgun with the purchase of a Chrysler, Dodge, Jeep, or Ram truck. So, if they had a Hellcat Charger or a Hellcat Challenger, you could go buy that car and get a free pistol, a free rifle. That'd be kind of cool. Or maybe you want, a, you want a Jeep like what I've got. Well, you wouldn't get a new one like mine. You get a new one of the body style after mine. Maybe you want a new Jeep of the newer body style than what I've got. Guess what? You could get a new rifle or a new pistol. And it's kind of cool that it's hitting this close to home. It's kind of uncool that I didn't know about it until I was going through my feeds for the show notes. If anyone from Benny Boyd is listening to this podcast, do me a favor. Advertise this on TV more. Because when I have to get something from my San Antonio about one county south of me, there's something wrong. But hey, good job. And let me say that in the article, they do point out that you have to be legal to purchase the handgun and they're not selling the, or to purchase the rifle. And they're not selling them or not giving them away at the dealership. They're actually 
doing this promotion in conjunction with Jeebos and Andrews. And Jeebos and Andrews is an FFL, so you buy the vehicle, you get the gift certificate, and if you're ineligible for to legally own a firearm, I think they give you $500 cash. But in the end, that's kind of a cool thing. I like it. I like it a lot. If I didn't already have a Jeep, I might be tempted to go buy a new one just for that. Mm, maybe not. I got enough rifles. I got enough handguns. Or do I? Hmm. I need to look into that. Just kidding. Hey, anyways, let me just say it's been fun. I'm going to wrap this episode up, so please stay safe and carry responsibly. Thank you for listening to the Gun Rights in Texas podcast. Please leave a review on iTunes or send feedback to the host. Your input will be used to improve the show. Stay safe and please carry responsibly. I've come to the conclusion, I have enough vehicles, but I don't have enough guns.